Thanks. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Perfect. So thanks, Johanna. Um, and hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, so today I'll talk about some of the best practices uh, for building SDKs in Go. Uh, but first, uh, who the hell am I and, and why should you be listening to me? Uh, so my name is Devakar. Um, I work in infrastructure engineering at Dropbox. Uh, and I've been at Dropbox for a few years now. Um, and in that time, I've had the opportunity to work on uh, some really interesting problems. Uh, so these days, I, I manage an organization uh, that's building product-focused infrastructure services. Um, so think search, uh, machine learning, um, indexing, event processing, email messaging infrastructure, um, things of that sort. For the purpose of this talk, however, uh, the most relevant bit is that I built the Go SDK for Dropbox, um, and I also built DBX CLI, uh, which is a command line tool for interacting with your Dropbox. Um, and that was built using the SDK. So I built the SDK first and then built this tool uh, with that SDK. Uh, and taking inspiration from Ashley's and, and Matt's talk this morning, um, here's what I look like as a gopher. Um, so uh, if you use Dropbox or have you heard of it, um, can you raise your hands if people are familiar with what Dropbox is? Good, good, great. Uh, so I promise this is my only marketing slide. I won't talk about Dropbox um, after this. So Dropbox's mission is to simplify the way people work together. Um, and Dropbox is used uh, successfully by individuals, teams, and businesses all around the world. Um, and we're really evolving from being a, a storage company, and we're really good at keeping your files in sync, to more a collaboration company that helps um, key teams stay in sync with each other. So at Dropbox, uh, we, we love Go. Um, as some of you maybe know, um, Dropbox is a big Python shop, and we started out with pretty much everything in Python. Uh, but over the last several years, uh, most of our backend infrastructure has been written or rewritten in Go. And recently, more and more front-end services are also being written in Go. So now we have uh, several low-latency critical production services um, in Go that are serving millions and millions of requests per second, so some pretty large-scale systems. Um, so my colleague, Tammy, um, gave the keynote at Gopher GopherCon um, in Denver last month, uh, and that has a lot more information about how we do Go at Dropbox. Um, it's a great talk. I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, we open source a lot of stuff. Um, it's all up on um, GitHub, including a bunch of Go-related projects as well. Um, and you can find both the SDK um, and DBX CLI uh, in there too. Uh, last quick note, we are hiring. So um, um, you have the pointers there, um, or just come talk to me after the talk. So, so that's it uh, for context. Uh, let's uh, dive right in. So uh, for this talk, um, I've tried to distill out some of the best practices uh, based primarily on my experiences um, building the SDK for Dropbox. Uh, but I also include examples from other popular SDKs, uh, uh, in particular the AWS SDK and then the Google Cloud SDK, where appropriate. Um, and while the lessons um, are in the context of building an SDK um, in Go, most of them should be applicable for SDKs and libraries in general um, across languages. So let's get started. So when I first started implementing the Dropbox SDK, you know, you encounter a new API um, and you start tinkering with it. So I was just writing code, implementing one API call at a time. You're like debugging. There's a lot of churn in the beginning as you're figuring your way around the, the API. Uh, it's easier to iterate and faster to test. Uh, but then it quickly became repetitive and boring. And, and so how do you scale that process? So it shouldn't come as a surprise that uh, SDKs typically constitute a lot of boilerplate. Um, think documentation, error handling, RPCs, serialization, deserialization. And so a lot of what SDKs end up doing is pretty mechanical. And, and so not surprisingly, most SDKs these days are auto-generated. Um, and so I recommend um, you do the same for your SDK. Um, so when we talk about you know, how to use code generation for SDKs, there are really two parts to it. Uh, first, you need to define what your API is. Um, and so the, the API specification can be done you know, using a domain-specific language that's designed specifically for that purpose. Or you can use like any existing markup languages, like JSON or, or YAML. Uh, 
And then you have you know, a set of target languages that you want to create your SDK for, and so you have some generator that takes in uh, the specification as input and then spits out the code in, a, um, in this language. So Dropbox has an open source uh, project called Stone, um, and this is a combination of both a, a domain-specific language for laying out um, an API, and then we have generators for different languages, uh, including Python.NET, Java, and JavaScript. Uh, if you look at the Google and AWS SDKs, they, they both um, provide the API specification in JSON, and then they have some custom logic um, to, to generate the code code. Um, so if you look through the, the source code, um, the code generators are actually included in the repository, so you can see how they are going about it. There is a lot of activity in this ecosystem uh, recently, so uh, maybe some of you have heard of the Open API initiative. So um, this is an evolution of what used to be called Swagger. Um, I, I know that in the Java world, Swagger was pretty popular. Um, and uh, I also recommend checking out uh, something called API Blueprint, um, and there's another service called API Matic. Um, so they make it really easy to, to build and maintain multiple SDKs in different languages, different platforms. Um, uh, so if you're building an SDK and targeting multiple languages, um, definitely go with um, code generation. All right, so this next one um, is really not specific to SDKs. Um, you can apply it to pretty much everything in life. Um, uh, basically, put yourself in the shoes of the consumer, the person who's using your SDK, and try to think if they would find anything surprising, any behavior that is unexpected um, in the process. So in the context of Go, uh, this might manifest um, in a few different ways. So if I go get the SDK uh, from GitHub or wherever, I don't want to be pulling in random third-party dependencies. And so SDKs shouldn't really have external dependencies. Um, of course, it's, it's OK to have standard library imports in there. And by the same logic, SDKs should not include any vendored dependencies either. Similarly, for APIs which have a large surface area, there's like lots of different functionality that's in there. Um, you know, again, AWS is a good example, even the Dropbox API. Uh, the SDK should provide sort of scoped sub-packages sub so users can really just import the pieces that they need. Um, Especially, you know, since Go binaries are statically linked, the size of the binary is just proportional to the amount of code that you're importing. So it's really critical to let people have the flexibility to pull in what they need. Um, so what I recommend doing is, you know, whenever you have an, a library or an SDK, just start like a fresh new project, like go get the SDK yourself, and then just validate like what a user will see uh, and if it matches your expectations. So for this next one, we're, we're thinking about um, the SDK as a versatile tool that you want to be use, uh, want to be able to use in different contexts for a variety of use cases. And so to that end, aspects of the SDK must be made configurable, and that configuration must be made simple. So let's take a, a couple of specific examples. Um, so there are a couple of different ways of going about you know, um, making it easy for users to provide uh, these configuration options. Um, I don't recommend using command line flags for this. Um, part of the reason is that Go's built-in um, flag functionality is pretty limited. So you don't have global flags. Um, like you know, in the C++ world, we have G flags. Um, and there is a Go implementation, but it's not quite the same. Uh, so libraries can't really define flags that are automatically then exported to an application. So even if you use command line flags, an application might not have any way to actually utilize them. Um, you could use um, you know, the Go, Go implementation of G flags, and there are P flags and many other uh, third party packages out there that are really good. Uh, but then that violates sort of the previous principle uh, where we're trying to minimize the, the footprint that our SDK has in terms of external dependencies. Uh, you could use environment variables, uh, but there are you know, sort of well-known pitfalls of doing that. Um, the one that I particularly uh, uh, like to watch out for is that environment variables make like, unit testing and having like, good mocks uh, pretty hard, because you have this global state that then is visible to sort of everything that you're running on your system. Uh, so it's a little bit harder to kind of have that isolation. Um, so instead, what I recommend is just encapsulating all the configuration in a, in a data structure that you can then pass into the SDK. And then it frees the application to populate the structure however it wants. Um, it can use command line flags. It can use environment variables. Um, so you kind of decouple the mechanism from the policy. Uh, the other thing I would recommend is to, to not have any persistence capability um, in the SDK. So the SDK should not be in the business of like saving configuration to disk or reading it from the disk. Uh, it should just have 
uh, an option to pass in configuration when you initialize the SDK, and then applications sh should handle all of the persistence. So, so this is what DBX CLI does, sorry, um, where um, it stores the, the configuration information in a JSON file, loads it when it you know, start up, um, and passes it through um, when we initialize the SDK. All right, so for this next one, um, uh, you know, we maybe some of you were in the deep learning um, talk before uh, lunch. Um, you know, perhaps one day we'll have uh, incredible code generation, and you know, like we'll have machine learning and AI that can generate completely bug-free code. Um, until then, we have to live with uh, buggy code that us humans write. Uh, so, for an application developer, it's really critical to have visibility, um, obviously for code that they write, uh, but more so for code they did not write. So if you're pulling in the SDK, your application starts behaving badly or there is some error scenario, uh, you really want to understand what the SDK is doing. If there is a failure coming in from within SDK, um, can you make it easy to debug? Uh, if there's a bug within the SDK itself, like can we make it easy to kind of distinguish usage bugs from actual SDK bugs? Um, so logging is the, the uh, specific example here, so let's talk about that for a second. Um, so in general, it's a good idea to have some sort of verbose logging capability in your SDK. So by default, you know, you're not doing anything, but then if you want to have more visibility, you can turn on verbose logging. Uh, this is especially useful in the early days when you're really iterating through the SDK, you're making a lot of changes, um, and there, it's more likely that you have more bugs. Um, uh, similarly, an application might want to control where the logs go. Um, so, you know, the, the default might be standard out or standard err, but you might have a custom logger, or maybe you want to send it to Hive or some analytics pipeline or something else like that. Um, so once again, uh, we are a little bit limited by the functionality in the Go standard library. Um, there isn't like a built-in framework for configurable log levels or um, custom loggers. Um, so we can leverage, um, at least for some of these things, um, the, the, the approach that we described in the previous lesson. So you can have uh, a structure that has you know, some verbose flag and maybe has a you know, custom logger that um, users can pass in. And so here's like a simple um, try log method that you can use within the SDK that honors this verbose flag um, and then additionally uses a custom logger if specified. Um, the, uh, the AWS SDK does something similar, uh, but it goes a, a step further and actually defines um, its own logging interface uh, with different log levels. Um, so you can certainly get fancy and you know, provide like, the richness um, that you need within your SDK. Uh, but again, like, they're not pulling in any third-party dependencies. It's all implemented as part of the SDK itself. Okay, so this next one uh, was um, uh, one of the most frustrating things for me. I, I struggled a lot with uh, um, this particular aspect when I was um, building the, the Go SD for, SDK for Dropbox. Um, so I'm sure everyone here has their own story of uh, run-ins with Go's lack of commonly supported language features, um, you know, whether it's generics uh, or union types or um, you know, good support for inheritance and subclasses. Um, and this is especially problematic if you're using a specification to generate code, right? So the specification might have certain expectations, and it might be easier to express those in one language over another. Um, and, and so it, it becomes a little bit challenging to sort of customize the code generation. Um, unfortunately, there's really no silver bullet here. Um, the best thing you can do is to try to use idiomatic uh, Go code as much as you can, and, and even if it is not the most elegant and has some rough edges. Um, so let's, let's take a couple of examples. Uh, so consider a union type. Um, so here, uh, we're, this is an example from the actual Dropbox API, and the specification at the top is written in the Stone um, domain-specific language. Um, so, so we're saying that we have an error of type, um, you know, it's called delete error, and it can either be a lookup error, so for example, the path that you're trying to delete doesn't exist, or it can be a write error. Maybe you don't have permissions to delete that file. And at the bottom, there's a, you know, a JSON representation that's sent by Dropbox's servers. So now, um, notice that in the JSON representation, the path lookup member, which is of type lookup error, um, is itself a union, and so obviously, when we're describing a, a struct, the, each of those fields could be of any type. There could be a primitive type, there could be another structure, there could be a union, or there could be you know, any other um, structure. So we want to be able to handle all of that uh, complexity. Uh, one thing to note here is uh, this is what is called a, a tagged union. So we actually have a tag field, uh, which we can use to identify which member of the union is actually being set. Um, 
So, so how might one represent this in Go? So a very natural representation is to just um, um, represent this as a Go struct. Um, and you have one field for each of the, the possible uh, values in the union. Um, the, the challenge is when we try to serialize this, uh, or we, when we try to deserialize the JSON, um, you start to run into to issues because either there are empty values or they're not deserializing into the right structure um, and, and things like that. So how do we handle serialization and deserialization to, to honor union semantics? So for serialization, one simple trick is to, to use the omit empty JSON tag um, in, the, in the description. So uh, that simplifies at least the serialization. So if a field is not set, uh, it will just be omitted in the JSON out output. Uh, for the deserialization piece, uh, we have to override the unmarshal JSON method. And the trick that we use is to have an interim structure where the fields are actually of type raw message. So, so instead of their actual type, they're of the type raw message, which allows us to take the JSON as is. And then using the value of the tag, we can then deserialize that specific subset of the JSON into the appropriate subtype. Um, so, so there's some code sample on the right that kind of describes um, what I'm saying. So here's another example, um, which is pretty easy to translate in object-oriented languages like Java. So you have a base type. Uh, let's say in this case, you know, it's a, a, a type called metadata. And it's describing some common fields uh, that we might have, uh, maybe like they're a name or a path. Um, and then we have two subclasses, file metadata and folder metadata, that might have file-specific or folder-specific information. So how, do, how would we represent this in Go? Um, so the idiomatic way of just representing the data structures uh, would be via embedding. So you define uh, a struct metadata, have all the common fields in there, and then you have two structs, one for file metadata, one for folder metadata, both of which embed uh, the metadata type. OK, this seems reasonable. Um, so what are some challenges one might encounter uh, with this approach? So the first one is, is polymorphism. So in the classic object-oriented sense, Wherever a return value or an input parameter of the base type is specified, a subtype should be acceptable. So in this case, we have a list method that's listing all the files and folders in a given folder, let's say. So it's re returning a slice of metadata. And each of the elements in that slice could either be a file metadata or a folder metadata. So again, how do we go about uh, doing this in Go? Since there isn't um, uh, a built-in notion of subclasses and inheritance, uh, the idiomatic way to do this is to define a, a sort of a dummy interface. So, so we create an interface called isMetadata, which is basically empty. Uh, and then we have a, a null implementation of that um, interface. And since we are using embedding, we can just provide that implementation for the base type, so you can see the metadata type is the receiver there, and then it becomes automatically available to all the subtypes. And then wherever you would use uh, the base type or the union type, you can simply use is metadata instead of saying metadata or file metadata. The second problem um, with inheritance is, again, serialization and deserialization. So, so if you look at the JSON representation of something that um, comes back from, at least um, in Dropbox's case, the JSON representation might have all fields corresponding to one type or the other type. And so if we look at the, the data structures that I defined earlier, if you try to use the default deserialization for either the base type or one of the subtypes, it won't work properly in, in all of the cases. So how do, we, um, how do we go about uh, solving this? So again, we can, we can use a trick similar to how we handle unions. Uh, so in this case, what we would do is um, define a temporary structure that maps all of the subtypes to um, a, a tagged union where each field of the union is a, a subtype that we are expecting. Then we deserialize um, using the tag value into this temporary union structure. And at the end of that deserialization, we know one of the subtypes has been populated. Um, and then we can return that value. Uh, and since each of the subtypes is implementing this interface, um, you can see the return value of that is metadata from JSON method is, is of type is metadata. So we don't need to actually have a concrete type in there. And then from an application's perspective, you can use type assertions to determine which concrete type you're getting back. So, so that's um, uh, the approach that we took for the, the, at least the Dropbox SDK. All right. So this next one is about security. Um, 
Might sound a little bit counterintuitive, uh, but at least in my opinion, um, SDKs should not do any authentication um, internally. Uh, so let me clarify uh, what I mean by that. So all of this is assuming you're using OAuth. Uh, if you're not using OAuth, there are other protocols that are similar in nature um, uh, and should be applicable for any like OAuth-like protocol. But the idea is that authentication really should be the application's responsibility and not the SDK's responsibility. And, and the reason is um, the application knows what works best for their use case. And like it's a, if it's a web-based application, they might use a web-based OAuth workflow. If it's a command line tool, it might use a slightly different OAuth workflow. You might have two-factor authentication or other things um, in your authentication path um, that you want to incorporate. From an SDK perspective, like all that we care about is that we have some authenticated token that you provide to the SDK. And if the token is not valid or unauthenticated, you can fail gracefully, uh, but that's really all you need. Um, so, so that's, and it really limits the interface that the SDK exports to the outside world. Um, so it simplifies a, a lot of the things from an SDK perspective as well. Now, uh, even um, from an application standpoint, um, there are some peculiarities, peculiarities in Go about OAuth um, that you should be aware of. Um, so one particular problem that I ran into um, when I was building um, some applications using the SDK is that uh, we had the default um, OAuth endpoint of api.dropbox.com. And at some point, we still had that endpoint working, uh, but at some point in our documentation, we started saying that this endpoint will be deprecated at some point in the future, and there is a new endpoint, api.dropboxapi.com, that applications should start using. So, so obviously, I thought, okay, I should update my applications um, to start using this new endpoint. So that is the only change I made, just the OAuth endpoint, nothing else. And my application started failing. And, and the error message was pretty bizarre and kind of like obscure with like really no information. Um, it just said, um, you know, cannot fetch token bad request. Um, and so, you know, in my case, I had the visibility on the server side. I could go look what was happening there. Uh, but it took quite a while of uh, digging and actually looking at the um, OAuth source code in Go. And I discovered this, uh, what, I, what I thought was a pretty amusing gem. So um, in the OAuth internals, there is a list of what they call broken OAuth header providers. Um, and the reason that they're broken is that, you know, this is a list of providers that each have some quirks in how they implement the OAuth spec. And, and so maybe it talks to, you know, how complicated the spec is and, and, and how different each of the implementations end up being. So the problem was that dropboxapi.com was not registered as a known set of domains that are implementing the spec in this, like, quirky way. Um, and so um, the OAuth implementation was treating it more strictly and then and causing this failure. But again, note that in this case, the library did not do a good job of providing me visibility into what was going on. Uh, if there was a way for me to like, enable verbose logging in Go's internals, like, it would have made my life a lot simpler. Um, so anyways, after much digging, I discovered this. Thankfully, the OAuth internals do export a public method uh, that allows you to register a new domain as a broken OAuth header provider. Um, and so once I did that, everything started working uh, fine. Ironically, uh, Google, Stripe, Instagram, Facebook, these are all broken OAuth providers. So um, again, tells us something about the OAuth spec. OK, uh, this next one, um, since we're recommending code generation for SDK uh, itself, it, it follows naturally that we should try to use code generation for tests as well. And there are a few reasons why for tests, it's actually um, uh, pretty powerful to be able to auto-generate um, tests. Um, so the, one of the problems with tests is that they often end up being outdated or like not consistent across implementations. So if you have an API and SDK implementations for let's say seven different languages, you'll often see that the test coverage for those seven different languages is dramatically different. And then you would take into account you know, things that are changing from an API perspective, methods get deprecated, new methods get added, it's an ever larger sort of surface area of changes that are happening. Uh, it becomes really hard to make sure that you have really good test coverage, especially for things that you know are supposed to work. So for example, there are known failure modes that you're covering in your documentation. It is, it's good to kind of capture them in some sort of specification and, and then make sure that you always have tests that cover that. Um, I will caveat that the Dropbox SDK is not a good example of this, so, so definitely don't look at that as, as a model. Uh, we hardly have any test coverage right now. I'm hoping we'll change that soon. Uh, 
Um, the AWS SDK is a pretty good model. Um, so they do define um, example inputs and outputs in a JSON file, uh, just like they define their API specification itself. And then um, right now they only have this Go generator that takes this JSON file and, and spits out test cases. Of course, it doesn't mean that you should stop writing tests. I mean, this is not a panacea. Um, think of it as a complementary strategy in addition to like, all of the other testing that you're doing, um, all of your unit tests, your integration tests. Um, in particular, the auto generation strategy doesn't work that well for negative test cases. Like There are specific edge cases and failure modes that you know will happen knowing the code that you've written um, or knowing how the SDK is working internally. Um, that maybe are harder to specify as inputs and outputs, so it's harder to auto-generate code for them. So for those, you should still make that effort to like handcraft tests that are capturing those scenarios properly. And last but not least, um, error handling. Um, you know, love it or hate it, Go is very opinionated and very constrained about how error handling is done. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, you know, it's, it's rather than fight uh, the Go way of doing things, uh, it's better to go along with the um, Go idioms where possible. Um, so in this case, you know, there are obvious things like if you have custom like error types within your SDK, they should all implement the error interface so that you can use them as error values. Uh, makes your code composable, makes it easier again. You know, avoid sur sur avoid surprises uh, from a user perspective. Um, but then also um, making sure that your um, errors are implementing the, the interface allows callers to use type assertions. So from an API method, you could be returning just a blanket error type, but then the caller of the method can use type assertions to dig into API-specific information. So um, here's an example of how uh, we do this in the Dropbox SDK. Uh, the AWS SDK has a very similar um, pattern as well. Um, there are some really useful packages out there for sort of combining multiple errors. So, um, you know, one of the things that, for example, I wish we had better support in the standard library is if you have an API method that's asking to delete, you know, or do like more than one thing. So let's say you're trying to delete a batch of files. Right now, we only have the capability to kind of return one error and then embed like, all of the details about exactly which things failed and which things succeeded um, as, as a custom type, uh, it would be a little bit more natural to just you know, be able to say, like, return a set of errors that the callers are then able to um, deal with in a more systematic way. So there are packages out there that help do this. Um, also, like unrolling a stack of errors is something that's pretty commonly um, you need to do, especially if like, call chains get deeper and deeper. So again, it would be great to have better standard library support for these things. You could choose to use those third-party packages, uh, but for the Dropbox SDK, again, because we're trying to minimize our external dependencies, um, right now we're not doing any of that. All right, so to recap, um, here are sort of the eight um, learnings um, that I have uh, from this experience of, of building an SDK for Dropbox. Uh, the first one, uh, just use code generation. Uh, it it's makes your process much more scalable, makes it a lot easier to launch SDKs in newer languages. Um, the second one um, is to just avoid surprises from a user perspective. Um, make sure that you're validating the behavior as a user would do. Uh, make the SDK configurable. Uh, make that configuration simple. Um, don't lock down choices. So, so the easiest thing to do is to just decouple what the SDK expects as a configuration and then let applications populate that however it works for them. Make sure you have um, some sort of verbose logging option in the SDK. Um, maybe have some configurable logger as well. If you want to be fancy, you can have configurable log levels too. Um, for unsupported types like unions and, and inheritance, I covered a couple of strategies for um, handling those. There might be other such cases as well. So again, try to really stick with Go idioms. Um, choose the, the most idiomatic way you can come up with. Um, it can be a little bit challenging, and there can be sort of rough edges. Um, uh, but still, um, try to, uh, don't try to invent like a new union type that has like a totally um, new set of APIs. Um, don't do any authentication within the SDK. Let applications handle that, and the SDK should just accept uh, a pre-authenticated token. Uh, where possible, auto-generate your test cases as well. Um, again, it gives you really good coverage and make sure that across languages, across platforms, your test cases are providing like, the right um, coverage. 
And then uh, finally, for error handling, uh, make sure you're implementing the error interface. Uh, make it easy for people to get SDK-specific error information. Type of solutions are, are pretty useful for that. Um, and then you can use third-party packages if you need uh, more complicated functionality around multiple errors um, or unrolling a stack of errors. Uh, I mentioned this in the beginning, but where do you get the SDK? So I have the GitHub um, URLs up there. Um, uh, DBXCLI, I'll put in a plug for that. This is a command line tool, um, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so my particular um, pet peeve for building this was, uh, let's say you want to access something in your Dropbox. You, know, you can go to the Dropbox website and download a few files, but there are limitations on the operations that you can do through the web interface. The other option is to install Dropbox on a computer and sort of wait for it to synchronize all of this content. Um, so this command line tool was a way for me to just interact with my Dropbox, like easily upload, download, share files, like without installing the client or going through the website or anything like that. It works on all platforms. Uh, there are pre-compiled binaries for, for various things out there. It's also useful for team administrators. You can sort of add, remove members in your Dropbox business account and things like that, so it makes it scriptable. Um, and um, there is support for Dropbox paper coming soon, so we already have APIs for Dropbox paper. I just haven't exposed them into the SDK uh, or in the command line tool. If you don't know what Dropbox paper is, it's a new collaboration product. Um, you can go check it out. And with that, I just want to thank the organizers uh, and all the sponsors for this opportunity and for putting together such a great program. Uh, most of all, thank you all for being such patient listeners. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Question over here. So the, um, the stone tool that you have, did you write that for this, or did you, did so the Swagger one work first, uh, or? Uh, so, yeah, so um, the stone tool was written internally because we were, um, a few years ago, we launched sort of version two of the Dropbox APIs, and we already had, I think at that point, six different SDKs in various languages. So the first set of SDKs were all built by hand by various people. So when we were doing the V2, we built the um, sort of specification language and generator so that we could do like this transition at once. And then, um, uh, so that tool was independently open sourced. And then for building this SDK, I essentially wrote a Go generator for Stone um, uh, it's not part of the Stone uh, repository just yet because uh, the current generator has a few things that are Dropbox specific and are specific to this SDK. Um, so in, ideally, we want a generator that if you give it a specification, it just gives you the code and like it doesn't need to know what namespace to put things in and things like that. So, so there's a little bit of cleanup that still has to happen, uh, but you can still take the generator. The generator is open source. It's just part of the SDK, not of Stone. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. All right, great.